Hello, everybody, and welcome to Scale American. Today, I'm really, really delighted to join a very special guest, is George Mendeluk. Hi, George, how are you? That's right, and you know, I'm really, really happy to have you back here with us. So, you know, we have to say that we're here today to talk for, you know, something very, very important that you've been working on, you know, in these uh, last years. And uh, it is a movie and it is called uh, Bitter Harvest. And, you know, I'm going straight, you know, to ask you uh, if you can tell us a bit about, you know, the story behind this movie and, you know, what actually uh, inspired you uh, to make this movie? that is first and foremost a romance in the paradigm of let's say dr shivago years ago you're too young to remember the movie but but it was and david lean doing it i'm not saying the movie is as good or i'm like david lean but i'm saying that it's similar in structure because you have two lovers in this case it's max irons who plays an artist peasant and samantha barks who was in epinoni and les miserables playing uh, his his love mm -hmm. and they they first meet as children innocent children and it's very idyllic and very lyrical uh, because I wanted to frame it in the terms of Ukrainian Kaska tales you know Grimm's fairy tales weren't always all snowflakes and everything there were little kids being trapped and eaten and so on and so forth so I wanted to paint this picture of these young lovers when they were young Right. And then they fall in love, and then against that backdrop, we have probably one of the worst um, genocides ever perpetrated on man, and also kept secret, which was uh, Stalin's forced artificial starvation pro a program on the Ukrainians that ultimately killed four to seven million Ukrainians. And my mother actually survived. So when you say that what prompted you to do this <clears throat> first of all the script came to me uh, from Richard Bachinsky who was an actor that I directed years ago and he had he hadn't written the script before but he had some really great ideas in it and he had what I saw the concept of the artist as warrior mm -hmm. and a joke that he went on um, because you know Stalin used food as a weapon yeah. well art can be a weapon too and so I saw that as a theme and a hook. And then, personally speaking, why I wanted to do this picture was because my mother survived it. When I was a little boy, she told me some stories that I never forget. And one of them was when she used to go to school, she would go with her girlfriend, Hala. And uh, they would go to school and would see little kids begging on the street. This was in the city of Kharkiv. And when they came back from school in the, in the afternoon, those same children, many of them would be lying dead. Oh she would see people begging in bread lines, and sometimes she was so weak with her friend that she had to hold on to the people in front of her because she'd, she'd collapse, because hunger is probably one of the worst, worst ways to die. You know, it takes a long, long time. And uh, it's just a horrible death. And then she told me how her friend actually died one day in school and she lost her. She was sitting in front of her, and I'll never forget this as a child, because when you get towards the end of your uh, starvation, you get bloated. You know, you puff out. Yeah. And water came from out of her and she just collapsed and died in front of her. So that, you know, I was five, six years old. That stuck in my mind. And so I wanted to basically shed a light on, on secret Be, because the other thing that that kept this uh, a, a great great secret that not a lot of people know about was the iron curtain yes. the other thing I'd like to discuss is the whole notion of fake news it's not a current phenomenon there's a lot of uh, um, fake news uh, in the uh, in the air now the term and that being thrown around but really it started a long time ago the New York Times was a great perpetrator in trying to cover up the the Holodomor because at that time I think Russia was trying to gain 
diplomatic relationship with America and vice versa with um, President Roosevelt. So the idea was to keep the crimes of, um, of uh, Soviet Russia quiet. And uh, basically they sold the lives of people by doing that. Um, Walter Durante uh, basically got a Pulitzer Prize for lying. And he was the chief correspondent, most widely read at the time. Uh, and I'm talking about 1932-33. You can look yeah. this up on the uh, internet. And he basically said, there is no famine. It's malnutrition. It's bad weather. It's poor f farming practices. He was a master of euphemism. And so what happened was he was challenged by another graduate of um, Cambridge, because Durante was. His name was, he was a Welshman. His name was Gareth Jones. And Gareth Jones was a wonderful newspaper correspondent. He was the first to interview Hitler. And um, he also walked through, hiked through Ukraine during the famine, went into the villages, spoke to the people, slept on the floors, and gave them whatever little food they, you know, he had to share with them. And he would come back and he and he would write, rage and famine. But of course, Durante was the bigger power at that time, mm -hmm. and he was overlooked. Malcolm Muggeridge, who was an associate of um, Walter Durante, the famous British philosopher and writer and theologian, he also uh, wrote about uh, Durante, and he said that Durante was the biggest liar he had ever met in the newspaper world. Mm -hmm. So these were the forces that um, that uh, conspired to keep this quiet, and and even today, um, you know, newspapers are aren't really reporting what's happening and letting the aud and letting the um, audience readers what doing is colluding in terms of forcing and procreating an agenda that is uh, left-wing and socialist. I would like to ask you about actually, you know, let's say the research uh, process behind the movie, because, you know, I'm sure you have been doing, you know, a lot of research before, like, you know, all the uh, writing and, uh, you know, actually fixing the script, you know, before, you know, start shooting. So uh, how, how did the process go? Well, of course, I took a lot from my personal, not my personal experience, but my relationship with my family that went through this. But apart from that, um, I also read the book um, um, The Harvest of Sorrow by um, Conrad, and he passed away, and he was a, um, a Stanford professor. He is sort of the master of, of, of the um, genocide called the Holodomor, which incidentally means Holod means famine. More means death in French, so hello de more is how they created the word. And Bloodlands by Timothy Snyder, brilliant book. Uh, and he said that more, more people died in the Second World War in the area of Ukraine and, and surrounding than any time in history. And Stalin was, um, you know, largely responsible for that. And I, I also read um, The Red Tsar. You know, um, the Red Tsar in the court of uh, or Stalin, Stalin the Tsar in the court of the um, Red Tsar. I, I forget, Montefiore. Uh, the writer was Montefiore. I also read a, a lot of other books, including, and we had him as a, um advisor, uh, Ukraine, A History by Subtelny, Oris Subtelny, Ukrainian, very famous Ukrainian um, professor, and um, he just passed away. Mm -hmm. He was, I consulted with him on everything. So this, uh, and there's about three or four other books that I read, and our executive producer, Ian Ignatovich, also Ukrainian, whose family went through this, he um, he did a lot of research. We had a church a person, that's the head of a university, her name escapes me right now, that also uh, was a consultant to him. Mm -hmm. So personal experience, literature, online, Personal, also interviews with people. That's yeah. what uh, that, that's what created the um, this the script. Talking about you know actually the way that you know you've been uh, crafting, let's say you know the the main characters. You know what can you tell us about this? Well, if you remember, I'm a great fan of Joseph Campbell. Yes, yes, I do. Right, I'm the mythologist, and um, so are a lot of other writers, including 
uh, George, um, oh, Star Wars, George. Lucas. Lucas, of course. And and um, basically, I, I think his paradigm is just brilliant. And you begin every voyage of, uh, of every hero, and indeed, every voyage of every human being, including you and me and everybody listening, begins with a call to action where they get separated from the ordinary world, whether it's their village or their own ordinary reality. They cross the point of no return. They have a threshold guardian that takes them across the river from which they can never return. Their lowest point is in at the bottom of the journey where they have ego loss. They don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. The subconscious is, uh, is uh, basically uh, where they're living. And then they get another call to come and they river again and they come back a changed person because the whole journey of a hero or heroine is to confront their fear and yeah. if they conquer fear then emerge and transcend into another person and when they come back they bring an elixir information knowledge whatever it could be to to you know to their village as a sort of the fruit of their journey so this is the uh, this is the story of um, of yuri and 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 the talk up. Yuri leaves the village to go to Kia to study art. He um, he has a mentor that takes him across uh, to Kiev. And I'm talking metaphorically and symbolically here, right? And then and then the lowest point. I'm not going to be a spoiler, but the lowest point is um, um, is when he doesn't literally know where he is and and what's going to happen to him, and he's the most afraid. Yeah. And then of course he comes back. And he, and he joins the real world, but he has something that he's bringing back. It could be food, it could be love, it could be whatever. So I like that. And so this actually, my sort of way of writing, helped me to rewrite the way I did. And it was about 12 rewrites. Uh, and also it was um, uh, about three months writing the treatment and about another six months writing the, um, the final shooting script. I see. So there is really you know, a, a lot of work you know, behind actually you know, this writing. Uh, talking uh, actually about uh, you know, the, the casting uh, process, so uh, that's also a very important part, like you know, the time that you, know, you have to uh, choose actors to actually you know, become those characters. So, you know, t tell me how was that? Well, casting is the most important part of directing. If you cast the people correctly, you have to do very little as a director except guide them in certain cases when they get off off track and make sure that they know where they are in the journey of their character to remind them, okay, right now, this is happening, that happening, how do you feel before, before we go into a take and say, you know, roll camera in action. But we cast in uh, both Ukraine for about two weeks, and we found two wonderful actors, uh, and one was uh, called um, Alexander Pecheritza, and the other one comes from an illustrious family of uh, actors called um, the Stupka family. And um, so, so they, they enjoyed major roles in the picture, but the rest of the casting was done for about two weeks as well in London, England. I think um, the British actors are some of the finest on the planet, and, um, you know, uh, Max is, is just absolutely superb, I think, in this picture. And um, I think I think playing Natalka, Samantha shows a dimension to her acting that she hasn't shown before. Mm -hmm. Because Ukrainian women are very strong, and in the script there's a revolt that happens. And women used to lead the revolt to try to get back the grain from the, from the communists that would take it, confiscate it. And it was called the Babsky Revolt. And um, she looks Ukrainian, you know, she totally immersed herself in the research, as did Max, because he had to learn how to paint as a painter. And um, they, you know, the casting was very important and uh, very enjoyable. In terms of directing, this is one of the more enjoyable relation, uh, relations and experiences I've had with actors on set. Incidentally, the background artists. You know, the ones that were the reenactors yeah. for the hearts and, and they added authenticity because they know the original songs of, of what was sung then. That, and this is all fading from the culture. And then in the wedding, there's a wedding, there's a funeral, there's a marriage. 
and there's also the rite of the of, of spring, which almost every culture has, yeah. and uh, it's called the Kupala festival. And so all these things I wanted to put inject into the picture because the culture is, um, you know, as the generations go by, it's vanishing, and I wanted to preserve it. That's absolutely beautiful. And then I remember that you know while you were actually you know doing all this, uh, there was a time when uh, you know you, you started like you know to to tell me on Twitter that you were going to Ukraine, and I said you know what are you doing and so on. I'm doing a new movie, yeah. uh, and uh, uh, I remember you know the, the first time that you actually uh, went out for this movie in uh, Ukraine, uh, like you know going for uh, locations and so on. Like you know I think locations are something really really important. You know like choosing you know, the right ones so you know tell me a bit about this side of the movie as well so locations are very very important not only because this is cinema and you have to uh, tell your story in pictures as much as anything else but they inspire you and actors when i say you they inspire me as a director they inspire actors too because the actors feel the authenticity we filmed at a village in ukraine near kiev about 45 kilometers away and um, there, there was a conglomeration of different cottages that were 150 years old, thatched cottages, and people lived there and died there. And so you could feel the palpable souls of the people living there and, and how the people lived, you know, with chickens around the corner, maybe having, um, you know, a calf in the corner as well. And then the sleeping quarters was here, and the fireplace, which it's called a picture. So it gets you right into the mood, the authentic mood of telling your story. For the actors, it's inspiring too. Max and um, Natalka played uh, in interviews. And Max also studied art because he's an artist and he needed to learn how to. Uh, a paint in the movie, so we did that. And then we also filmed um, in um, London, in England, at Pinewood Studios, the famous Pinewood Studios. And um, we filmed in the uh, Bond water tank because there's an underwater sequence in the movie. I'll tell you that. Um, it's one of my favorite scenes. Uh, and um, uh, it was it was great to be, you know, where all these big pictures have been made where Marilyn Monroe filmed the, 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 uh, the, the prince and the Showgirl. And the showgirl, yes. With, with Lawrence Olivier going back to the 50s. So my, my cinematographer, Doug Milsom, who is one of uh, Stanley Kubrick's go-to people, uh, the cameraman, and I had some pictures taking there. And it was great to be just around that history and the ghosts of artists past. Talking actually about, say, the technical side of, you know, of shooting the movie, uh, which were, say, you know, uh, your favorite uh, moments and, you know, which were actually the moments that maybe have been a bit more challenging for you? That's a very good question. Um, I think, I think the challenging part was dealing with the famine victims because we, um, no matter what we tried to do, we tried to get people from the hospital that were suffering from anorexia, they still didn't look thin. And so as a director, you know, we had to also employ makeups and CGI uh, towards the end. But it's very hard. I mean, how can you actually get people that look like that? Nobody looks like that unless they're dying to be in your movie and that's not practical or, or what you want. Uh, so that was, uh, that was challenging. I think... Um, I think also uh, some of the um, it was challenging for me on an emotional level to film some of the Stalin scenes because we were there in the um, in the office in the building where Kaganovich lived and, and worked. Yeah. And so uh, that was very unpleasant for me because you know, you know my some of my family died and my people died basically. Um, the, the man that was pushing the trigger, if you will, pulling the trigger. So that was difficult. Um, I think uh, action sequences are always uh, challenging because you don't have a lot of time. But I had a second unit director that was very good. So I, we did storyboards. I planned them and he shot them. So that we kind of handled that. And my son, Alexander, did some of the second unit too, but with actors and not action. And he did some of the best scenes in the movie. 
Um, one day he ran out of light, and so I started the scene. He came back to finish it. He ran out of light, and uh, he had to come back. But it, the way the scene cuts, it's like one director did it. So I was, it was a pleasure working with him. He had a tough time because, you know, some people, he was young. He's young. Some people didn't know whether he had the ability, but he proved himself. So maybe I enjoyed myself. Um, I, I love the people. Uh, they're very kind. They're very big hearted. They're artists on all levels. They love to dance. They love to sing. They love to sew. Beautiful embroideries, you know, sculpt. They were very artistic very people. Very artistic, yes. And, uh, they don't deserve the treatment they've had over the centuries. Of course, not at all. Um, and uh, also, like you know, the story you know you've been telling about you know about the, the farming, like uh, you know, it has not been really told, like you know, in history books or like you know, even you know, if I speaking about myself, like you know, I, I knew it, you know, just by looking up some things on the internet, for instance, like, you know, it is really something that is untold. So, uh, you know, what you're doing with, with your movie, it is actually like, you know, a great service to history. So, you know, to Thank the you. truth. I'm just the messenger. I'm just the messenger, honestly. Uh, and um, it's not very often or it's very rare. I mean, I've been directing for over 40 years and it's very rare. This is the first time I can honestly say that I've had the honor and the opportunity to direct something that both entertains and enlightens. And um, I get all sorts of brain in other places. Um, I think we were, I was reading some of them to you before I went online yes. with you, um, thanking me for telling the story that, um, the grandparents told them and so on and so forth. So it's very gratifying. It makes it worthwhile. It's a legacy. I know this picture is going to outlive all of us. Um, and it's not just about making money. It's about shedding a light on something that's dark. You know, one of the things I'd like to say is that I think it's Carl Jung that said, what is revealed is healed. And what you resist persists. Mm -hmm. So if we keep you know, resisting, whether it's newspapers or governments or people, whatever it is, if we keep resisting the truth, the malignancy of that cover-up will linger and the people that have died will suffer more and it'll be bad karma as far as, as, far as I'm concerned and I don't want to sound like I'm all woo-woo here. Um, but if we shine a light, like a projector shines a light on the screen and projects an image, and we tell them to go away, I think um, Germany has done a wonderful job. Maybe they beat themselves up too much, if there is such a thing, um, in, in, in trying to make up for what they did. But um, they're an example that will take time to take responsibility. Uh, for what they committed during the Second World War. Absolutely, yeah. And has to use genocide, mass murder, or shootings, or, or whatever it is, to implement a system. It should feel right to the people. They should want it. If, if they're being forced into it, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you're talking about communism, or socialism, or um, national socialism, whatever you want to call it, it's wrong. And hopefully, this will make us think. Because I think we're we're in a dark period right now, and we need to remember the the, the history lessons of the past. Or, as the saying goes, we're going to repeat them. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, George, you know, like if. Uh Somehow, like, you know, I, I know that this movie has been like, uh, you know, a very uh, long uh, process for you and, uh, you know, in all, like, you know, it, its parts. Uh, and, uh, you know, like, you know, it has been a very long work. And uh, I, I think that, you know, sometimes when we go like to the, to the cinema, you know, we just think about, uh, you know, what we're actually watching on the screen, you know, as viewers, I say, like, yeah. and, you know, uh, usually people don't think very much you know, about what's behind it, you know, that's why I like to make, you know, to you all those questions about it, because I, I really want... Well. 
No, you're, you ask intelligent questions and they're insightful, and that's why I like talking to you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, and you know, like you know, from your point of view, uh, why you know any person like you know in the audience uh, would actually like you know to go uh, into the movie theater to see this movie? Why? Mm -hmm. Why somebody should go? Uh -huh. Oh, because like I was saying before, I think it entertains. I mean, if you love love stories, and um, you know people do, it's universal. Then that's one main reason to go. Um, I don't want people to think it's a documentary. It is not a documentary. I don't want people to think that it's um, a his. It, it could be a history lesson, but it's not a propaganda film at all. Uh -huh. It's really a film about two people, two lovers that just want to exist. And they love each other dearly. In order to enjoy their love and live on. And um, I won't tell you what the ending is, but no. But uh, I think that we, we actually did a lot of previews, and women like this movie a lot. And that's a really good indicator because women often drag their boyfriends or husbands to the, to the cinema. But I think if that happens, the men aren't going to be. Um, Sorry, they went because there's a lot of action and it's a lot of gripping. I mean, I've been in, I've been in previews in uh, Washington, New York, London, Kiev. There's going to be one in two days in Ottawa, where I am right now, Canada, and then in Toronto, my own hometown, before I finally go home. And so far, you could hear a pin drop through through the entire picture. Invariably, people cry and are emotionally upset, as they should be. I mean, if I have done anything that I am proud of, it's the fact that I am able to move people with this movie. Because how can you move people, how can you tell of such horror without moving people, then you've really failed. And inv invariably we've had uh, tears, uh, applause at the end of the movie, and standing ovations in several places, in London and also in Kiev. Mm -hmm. And I know that I've been getting emails constantly since the movie previewed in Kiev, which was four four days ago, and people say there was a standing ovations there as there well. Still, wow, so I want this to snowball. I want this to snowball. And I think that you know, once you're able to create, you know, such great emotions for people, like you know, your movie is already a winner. So, thank you, thank you very much. So, George. Uh, which uh, actually uh, other movies uh, might have inspired uh, you, like you know, for Bitter Harvest? Well, I must tell you that uh, I mentioned um, Dr. Shivago and David Lean. That was more in the writing um, and the storytelling, I should say, than in the cinematic quality. Of it. Then um, Schindler's List again by the sort of drama. Mm -hmm. and the storytelling of it. Um, but I think one of the movies, and you might find this strange, and I don't know if your audience will remember this movie, it was done in the 60s by, by um, Stanley Kubrick, it was one of his first films, Barry Lyndon, and it was a period piece. Mm -hmm. And uh, he lit that picture beautifully. It was like every frame was a por portrait, and he lit it with candlelight. So much of it was with candlelight. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted to do. And when I gave the script to Doug Nilsson, who was one of his um, main two cinematographers, because Dougie did um, Full Metal Jacket, uh, among other things, but he was with Kubrick right from the beginning, and he was the focus puller on Barry Lyndon. And I said to Doug, I said, how did you, how did you have lenses that could get the stop to full, fully shoot in, in, in really low, low lighting conditions, because it makes it look beautiful? And he said that they had lenses built uh, by NASA that uh, enabled Kubrick to do that. We tried to get Kubrick's lenses, but it was difficult and we had to go quickly. And so Dougie managed to get some other lenses. There were Zeiss lenses. And um, we used candlelight. And a lot of the quality of the picture has that painterly quality. So it's kind of a story within a story. It's about Yuri, who's a painter, learning how to craft. And it's also hopefully painterly the movie in its quality uh dougie was focus puller on that so it was very critical to you know an actor moves like this he's out of focus so he has to be able to compensate mm -hmm. and we forged a really great relationship together 
He's a dear friend, and uh, we're going to be making more movies together, hopefully. George, I really, really want to thank you, you know, for being with us and, you know, for sharing uh, all, you know, these uh, beautiful uh, talks about Bitter Harvest. Uh, and uh, uh, I think it is very important, like, you know, to remind uh, to our audience, uh, you know, the way that, you know, they can have uh, news and updates about you. So, you know, I'm going to tell them that, you, you know, they can follow you on Twitter on, at uh, Action Cut. Uh, and uh, uh, Beat uh, Harvest Film, that's for the movie. Uh, and as well, you know, on Facebook, uh, uh, under your own name. And yes, and your website. website. Yes. That's right. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, you know, I, I think that, you know, uh, uh, the, the best way, actually, you know, to uh, uh, get people to uh, love a movie and to see a movie is, uh, you know, actually uh, word of mouth. So, uh, you know, uh, and uh, of course, if, uh, you know, the people who, who have been uh, going already, like, you know, to uh, watch your movie will tell their friends and so on, like, you know, it's like a, a big chain of, uh, say, film lovers, if you want to say yes. so. <laughs> Uh, and uh, um, exactly. yes. I was going to say, <coughs> excuse me, I've had about 11 emails today from the Ukraine saying that all those people have seen the movie twice mm -hmm. and it's only been playing three days. Wow. <coughs> That's fantastic. It is. Fantastic. And in some of the theaters, they stand up and applaud. It's important to them. This movie hopefully will not only preserve their culture for the world to see as time goes by, but also to inspire them during their fight for freedom right now, as we have these difficult times with um, Russia, who is um, uh, incessantly keeping up the attack. Yeah. And uh, Bitter Harvest, uh, I want to remind that it is actually available already in uh, 45 countries uh, around the world. And so, you know, uh, especially I want to invite uh, our audience in the US and in Europe and, you know, everywhere they are, like, you know, to go and watch this magnificent movie because, you know, it is going to be a great experience for you, uh, a great visual experience because I think, you know, you, George, are, are really a visual poet. And, uh, you know, you. with this movie, you're really offering to us, you know, the best of your, you know, your, your movie making skills. Yes, I, I'm trying to. And I said, you know, I um, thank you for saying that. I um, I wanted to tell the story as much with images, if not more so, another than in other projects that I've done, as much as I did with words. So I've used a lot of visuals to tell the story. And uh, the Ukraine's a very visual con uh, country. I think people, it's a, an unusual movie. I think, you know, there's so many CGI movies of flying this and flying that. But this is an authentic, honest movie, uh, just like, you know, we were used to watching. And I think it's going to stick with you. You're, you're not going to forget this movie. I That's promise. Awesome. I know you are. <laughs> And George, so thank you, thank you so much really for being with us today. It is absolutely a pleasure and you know, we are really welcome, uh, welcome back to you anytime. Sure, sure. I'd love to come back. Thank you very much, Tisha. And I've enjoyed it. I must fight for my country. Ukraine must bow to our will. Having someone to live for gives me courage. Freedom in Ukraine! I will make it home to you. Harvest. Rated R.